everybody, I hope you're enjoying all the Christmas preparations. you have things with northern cardinals right now i have a lot and every year i send something with northern cardinals to my mom like this year i'm sending her some napkins and some towels she absolutely loves this stuff because the raw no northern cardinals in belarus i grew up with eurasian bullfinches and since christmas is this week i thought i would share a few stories behind those christmas birds from uh, various countries i'll start with eurasian bullfinches as you might know uh russia and that part of the world has a lot of snow and cold winters so eurasian bullfinches are not very really visible in the summer but their colors really pop in the winter so they are believed to have guided people to safer places when they were lost in those cold snowy forests of russia so ever since they signify hope and belief in better things to come and the other legend is uh, when jesus christ was crucified it was eurasian bullfinches that showed up and were eating thorns off his crown and then a drop of blood fell on their breasts and ever since the eurasian bullfinches have a bright red breasts around christmas time and they signify the blood of Christ. And now let's move to Great Britain. Even though they have Eurasian bullfinches there, it's actually the European robin that is the symbol of Christmas for them. So in the 19th century, male men in Great Britain used to have these um, orangish reddish uniforms and of course around christmas time everyone was so looking forward to seeing a male show up on their doorstep because that meant cards and chocolates and presents and then one day someone realized that uh, their mailmen looked very much like European robins that everyone saw in their backyards so they started calling mailmen robins and then another season a Christmas card showed up and instead of having a mailman delivering presents uh, on somebody's doorstep it was actually a European robin holding presents in its beak and saying Merry Christmas and ever since uh, Christmas cards in Great Britain have European robins on them check out Jackie Lawson's cards they're beautiful and she always has European robins on them and here in North America, the Northern Cardinal symbolized the blood that Jesus shed to redeem all mankind. So ever since then, uh, the Northern Cardinal reminds people of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made and peace and hope that it brings. When I installed that owl nesting box on our property, Jack Dupuy wrote to me and asked whether there were any owls that lived in cities and whether it was a good idea to install an owl nesting box in an urban area. Hi Jack, there certainly are several owl species that have adapted to living and breeding in city environments in North America. Perhaps the three most common from large to small are the great horned owl, the barred owl and the eastern and western screech owls. They can be found in urban and suburban parks, golf courses and other green spaces. The larger owls subsist on rodents, rabbits and birds up to the size of a pigeon or a grouse, while the tiny screech owls prefer mice, insects and small birds. And of course the big owls eat the smaller owls. Now you mentioned installing nest boxes to attract owls into city environments for rodent control. While it is true that barn owls in particular do eat a heck of a lot of rodents, especially when feeding young, it's probably truer to say that the rodent numbers control the number of owls and not the other way around. I do have barn owls breeding in my municipality, but they prefer to nest in barns and agricultural habitats. On the other hand, the great horned owls, barred owls, and screech owls nest virtually in my backyard among the Douglas firs and large deciduous trees, and if I wanted to, I could install artificial platforms and nest boxes for them. And I wouldn't worry about their presence disrupting my bird feeding activities, mainly because the owls are already there, whether I like it or not. And I do enjoy hearing their calling at night. When my wife and I head down to sunnier climbs for the winter, as many snowbirds do, we usually avoid packing clothing with dark colors like black and dark blue and dark brown, preferring instead white or light khaki colors so as to reflect heat and not absorb it. 
It turns out that we're actually mimicking the birds. A recently published study by researchers from the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology in Germany revealed that migratory birds tend to be lighter colored than non-migratory species. And the more they migrate, the lighter colored they are. The clever scientists quantified the overall plumage lightness, zero meaning black and 100 meaning white, in all of the bird species in the handbook of the birds of the world. Next, they compared the data on coloration with the species' migratory behavior, while controlling for other factors known to affect plumage color. They found that resident non-migratory birds tended to be darker than short distance migrants, and that the latter are darker than those bird species which travel farther. What was really cool was that their results were consistent among birds large and small, as well as water birds and land birds. The explanation makes sense too. Lighter colored plumage is advantageous to migratory species because it reduces the risk of overheating when the birds are exposed to a lot of sunshine. With our planet becoming hotter and hotter due to climate change, it'll be interesting to see how things play out further in terms of bird coloration. A couple of years ago, the RSPB decided to record a bird song and have it played on the radio and in public places in England. And not surprisingly, uh, this became really popular and now they have a bird song streaming radio and you can actually listen to all the songs on the RSPB's websites. While the idea has caught on and Australia is one of the latest countries to release an album of songs of endangered birds. The album titled Songs of Disappearance debuted at the top of the charts, beating ABBA, uh, Michael Bublé, and even Mariah Carey. This project is a collaboration between David Stewart, who's been recording birdsong all his life, and the Bowerbird Collective a multimedia duo. Songs of Disappearance features 53 songs and calls of endangered birds. Incredibly, the tropical Andes covers less than 1% of the Earth, yet it has the richest biodiversity of anywhere on the planet. It's also an area that is in desperate need of conservation efforts and protection. But as of this year, Audubon, BirdLife International, the American Bird Conservancy and Radlock are getting a helping hand from the Bezos Earth Fund, $12 million to be exact. The money is being donated to local and indigenous communities to help them set up conservation and protection initiatives in an area of about a million and a half acres. The Bezos Earth Fund, yes, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, was set up in 2020 and has made a $10 billion commitment to conservation. Conserva Avis is the name of this project and more information can be found on Audubon America's website. You know, I absolutely love this time of the year. I find that there is always some kind of a holiday magic right now. So I really enjoyed all the photos on our December photo contest. So let's check out the top five. But since it's Christmas, we will send prizes to all top five. Enjoy it. So here's the fifth place, the fourth place, the third place, the second place and the grand prize winner congratulations everybody january we are dedicating to quails pheasants grouse and turkeys all right everyone time to say goodbye uh, i'm wishing you a very merry christmas and a happy new year i'll see you in 2022